Welcome to Open Classroom, the Brown School's Digital Forum for Community and Conversation. I'm Danny Pape, Director of Career Services at the Brown School here at Washington University in St. Louis. I want to quickly do a little housekeeping. We're using a webinar format, so what that means is we can't see or hear you as attendees, but we would love to know your thoughts and questions throughout the program, so feel free to post those in the chat. Uh, and we will be monitoring those and leaving time at the end for question and answer. We're also streaming right now live on YouTube. So if you have a friend who couldn't join us in this virtual room, please, but still wants to watch us live, we'll put a link to our YouTube channel in the chat in just a moment. So don't hesitate to pass that on to friends and colleagues uh, here live right now. This is the last open classroom of the year, but we'll have an awesome slate of programming for 2023. So we'll also put a link to our open classroom webpage in the chat in case you wanna register for future programming. But now to today's program, Iran's Gen Z, the leadership of young women and girls in the national uprising. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Mitra Nase, Assistant Professor at the Brown School here at Washington University in St. Louis and the Research Director for the Initiative on Social Work and Forced Migration. Dr. Nase, I'll let you explain the genesis of this program and introduce our awesome panelist. Thank you so much, Daniel. Um, we are really happy to be um, with you today and we have three amazing um, panelists with us that I would love to introduce. I will start with uh, Mahia Ostovar, who is a lecturer in business information system at the University of Galway, Ireland. Um, during her doctoral studies uh, in France, um, Mahir's research focused on campaigns against mandatory hijab in Iran, which will be part of our discussion today, such as um, these are the name of the campaigns, My Estilty, Freedom, and White Wednesdays. Uh, she was also active in the Let's Talk campaign, which demands the Western feminists and progressives to not silence the criticism of Islam, especially by the Middle Eastern woman and the No to Hijab campaign, which calls on Iranian women not to wear the headscarf in Iranian public. Mayor's prim primary focus in all of these activities have been gender uh, promoting gender equality and promoting women's right over their body. Our second panelist, um, Shahzad, um, Chang Changal Bai is an artist and activist. She is also a lecturer at the Cooper Union and RISD. Um, she is also a co-founder and co-director of uh, From Iran platform. Her practice responds to sculpture in a vast field of media, including installation, video, photography, text, um, performance, as well as activism. Her works are context questioning to subjects of many immigrant artists uh, or fluid individuals, subjects such as local and global formation and anecdotal displacement and adjustment, interest and urge and privilege and progress. She uh, makes works in a variety of time-based medium in, in search of um, doubtful appearances of liberty, control and evil. Um, similar to Mahyar, uh, Shahzad was also active in a Let's Talk campaign um, and, um, and encouraging feminists not, not to be silenced in the criticism of Islam by Middle Eastern women. Shahzad received a BA in graphic design from Faculty of Fine Arts, Tehran University, and her MFA is in a sculpture from Yale University. Um, she is currently based in Brooklyn, New York. And our um, third panelist is um, Elise Arba. Um, she is the Iran country specialist from Amnesty International USA. She coordinates all the work done on Iran by Amnesty International here in the United States. Uh, she has been an Amnesty activist for about 35 years and also uh, coordinates the work done by country specialists to provide assistance to those seeking asylum and other forms of immigration uh, relief. She received her PhD from the Department of Near Eastern Studies at the University of Chicago. Um, welcome everyone, and we are eager to hear from you. Um, I have a couple questions that um, are based on um, questions that I received from uh, people who want to hear from you. But before asking those questions, uh, I want to ask you to tell us a little bit about yourself, about your journey, who you are, where are you going, 
and and your work with with this specific um, topic. Uh, how about starting with Mahia? Okay, thank you, uh, thank you, Mitra John. Uh, so thanks for inviting me. It's an honor to be here. Um, so as you said, um, I mean, currently I'm a lecturer in business information systems at the University of Galway in Ireland. Uh, I left Iran around 10 years ago um, to do a master in Belgium. And then um, I went to France to do a PhD. Uh, so in my PhD, thesis, as you uh, explained, I focused on campaigns movement against the compulsory hijab in, in Iran. Uh, for example, my sales of freedom, white men's days, and afterwards, girls of the Angola Street. Um, so basically, my research um, has been on the role of social media, digital technology, on social movements, but but by focusing on one specific social movement, which is the movement against the complex of hijab in Iran. Um, then I moved to Ireland, uh, and currently I'm a lecturer, assistant professor there. Um, then I have been involved in different campaigns um, as an activist, as you mentioned recently in Let Us Talk campaign, hashtag Let Us Talk, uh, which was basically um, encouraging Middle Eastern women to talk about their experience of Islam, although it might not be positive and to basically um, asking the international community to let these people talk and don't, um, uh, don't label, label them as Islamophobes. Uh, and we had an, another campaign, you know, to hijab, uh, which was basically encouraging the Iranian women uh, to go out to public space uh, without hijab. Um, so, yeah, that's basically my experience. Uh, I've lived the experience of living in, in Iran for 25 years. I haven't been back to Iran for five years now. Um, I'm waiting uh, for this revolution to happen and then go back to Iran again. Uh, <laughs> Because, um, yeah, I mean, because my research was a bit political, I was um, afraid of going back to Iran, but we're seeing uh, also with arresting dual nationals. Um, so I guess that's all for me for now. Thank you. And we would love to hear more about your perspective and this revolution that you're hoping to happen. Um, Sharza Jan, can, can we hear a little bit more about your journey? Sure. Thank you so much for having me on this panel. It's, it is an honor to be um, with you all. Um, so I kind of like similar to what uh, to the story of Mahia. I studied in Iran for my bachelor. I grew up uh, in the south in Ahwas um, for 14 years and then with family we moved to Tehran. I grew up in I mean, until I was 30, I was I was there and uh, I got my bachelor in graphic design from uh, Tehran University. Um, then I moved to the US to continue my education um, for a master's program and I lived um, in the US since. Um, so that has been nine years and the last time I was uh, able to travel was about five years ago as well. Um, I have been an artist most of my life, uh, but um, I guess uh, that comes, it came to a point that I started like finding myself to be uh, being more interested to work uh, in activism and around like a lot of social topics and political topics that is going on. Um, so for me, a challenge has been how to bring the like arts um, practice into like the activism and uh, that kind of practice, which has like different dynamics, each of them. But this has been a personal challenge for me. Um, uh, at the time of the campaigns, Let Us Talk, um, that uh, we, with Mahia and other women, we were working together and also the uh, No to Hijab, which mainly started on social media, such as Twitter from women in Iran, really. Uh, and then was lifted all, all around um, on the like Persian speaking platforms, I started noticing that how a conversation between um, the people inside Iran and then the diaspora and uh, mainly like people who are interested in the subjects, but they don't have like immediate access because of layers of filtering, isolation uh, and all, uh, the connection is needed. So I started this page from Iran, um, which for now is mostly a page, but we see it as a platform 
to expand in other forms as well that is mainly focusing on bringing some context to the subjects and giving some like you know um background about why why we are here what is happening like what is uh going on and um so that has been a project with me and uh, a few other uh artists uh have been working on since so yeah that's wonderful. I would love to learn more about it. Um, and Ellie's years and years of uh, advocating for for social justice. Please share more about your journey and and your work with us. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, so I um, I joined Amnesty International uh, when I was a student at the University of Chicago. So yeah, it was about um, more than thirty years ago. Um, I, uh, I I got involved with um, you know local group in Chicago, um, and um, at the same time I was um, I had just started uh, graduate school um, in uh, in the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations at the University of Chicago. Um, I my academic interests were in the Near East, although um, much earlier periods than uh, than the current current pre period, but. Um, because um because I wanted to get more involved with amnesty um and uh you know and again because of my interest in the in the in the Middle East I I I joined the um Middle East country specialist program um which is for people who who want to really focus on particular countries um and and be the the primary um primary resource person for amnesty for those countries so I joined the uh, Middle East uh, Country Specialist Program in 95. Um, I started working on Iran in 2000, and I've been working on Iran ever since then. Um, so actually, I'm a member leader in Amnesty. I'm actually not a paid staff person at all. Um, all the country specialists are member leaders. Um, and um, yeah, I've been working on Iran for, for more, you know, for more than two decades now. Um, and it's been both rewarding and and kind of frustrating, obviously, because um, because uh, it's such a challenge to work on Iran. Fortunately, I've I've had the privilege of of working with so many fantastic colleagues and partners, and I'm really glad to be part of this this panel. Um, and hopefully, we can uh, we can share our thoughts about how we can help the people in Iran who are very bravely um, standing up to uh, to assert their rights. Um, to free expression, free assembly. Um, these are universal human. Again, I should just say that Amnesty International believes in a universal standard for human rights. Um, we base our advocacy work on uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and international human rights treaties that um, that all the nations in the United Nations have pledged to adhere to, including Iran. So. Um, so the Iranian government has an obligation to abide by international human rights standards. So when we when we call on the Iranian government, when we call them out for violating human rights, we're, we're basically just telling them they have to adhere to standards that they themselves have already agreed to adhere to. Thank you. Yeah, and 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 that's a great great point to to start um, the conversation about what is actually happening in Iran. How how what is going on? What what is the ask uh, of the people? And and whoever wants to add more comments or or some perspective, share some perspective on that um, uh, among the panelists. Mm, I mean, I can start. So I think uh, probably everybody in your audience already knows how uh, it started. It started with, uh, I mean, I call it the murder of uh, Masa Amini by hijab police. Um, and the thing is that uh, this is, I mean, all people that have lived in Iran, and I guess there are so many of them, I mean, us and also in your audience, there are so many of them, we know that this isn't something new. I mean, the hijab police, their behavior, their violence against women, it is uh, very systematic. It's not something new. We are very familiar with it. The thing is that I think all of us could identify with Massa. We, we know that we could be uh, Massa. So it's like, uh, that's why basically this movement I think started because many women uh, could actually identify with with the story of Massa. 
Um, so the thing is that it was very shocking for us at the beginning also when we heard the, the, the news of death of Mahsa, but we couldn't probably predict that it would lead uh, to such a movement, even the person who wrote um, on her grave that uh, you, are, you are not gonna be dead, you will, uh, your name will become the symbol. He or she wouldn't also predict that this actually is gonna happen. Um, so, I mean, we know, we know this story, we all know this story. One thing that I want to say here, um, many people ask me, do you think this is a revolution? Do you think this is gonna change uh, the regime in Iran? Do you think this is gonna change anything? And I always say that, um, well, I trust my gut feeling, and I think many Iranians would ag agree with me because we have seen so many protests before this. This is not our first time. I mean, in these 40 years, we have seen different protests for different reasons. But many of us feel that this time is different. This time it feels different because what we see on the street, the demands that we are seeing, the acts of protest that we are seeing, they are so radical. And basically people of Iran, they have passed the point that there is no uh, turning back from it. Um, so the acts of protest that we are see seeing, they're so brave. Like I couldn't believe, I always say this, that one of, one of the things that for me was so shocking, I, I think it was the day four or five, the, five of the protests, in one of the northern cities, sorry, there was this video uh, that people were, were gathering around fire and they were dancing and young women, they were burning their scarves in the fire and they were dancing. So for me, watching that was really like, literally like watching my dream coming true. I couldn't believe that I can, I'm seeing, I'm watching something like that happening inside Iran, right? I mean, at the moment. So, um, from there, I mean, now we are seeing every day, like women burning their scarves, taking off their scarves. It has become, to some extent, I mean, the people that I can't believe, my, my aunt has been always religious, but she has started to go to public hijab. That's something that for me is shocking. So seeing all this, I feel that, okay, there's no turning back for, for people. The pe people are doing the acts of protest that, are so radical and so brave, and they are showing that they don't want this life, this life that is not normal, that is not a free life under the Islamic Republic. And they, are, they have made it clear that they don't want this regime any, uh, anymore. Of course, it's a journey. Of course, it's gonna take time. And of course, um, unfortunately, I mean, we need help um, from international community, from the West. Uh, it's not gonna be easy. Uh, but I think there is no way of going back. So it's it has it it is this has been really a turning point for the Islamic Republic. Um, so I mean I'm gonna let the others also um, share their ideas about this. But thank you, Elise Sharza. Do you think that this time is different? Um. Well, I just just to hop on what Mahia was saying. Um, I mean, the the current protesters are extraordinarily brave, especially when you when you look at the kind of response that they've met, you know, been met with from the Iranian authorities. Um, now this the Iranian authorities uh, have a playbook <laughs> um, and their playbook uh, is whenever they're faced with these kinds of uh, protests, most of which are, are peaceful, um, you know, they, they, they crack down with excessive and indiscriminate force. So, you know, they've been using, um, they've been using lethal weapons to, uh, to they've killed, I mean, we, we've documented at least, you know, over 300 people, but it, the, the true number is certainly a lot more. And sadly, this includes more than 40 children who've been killed. And it's just heartbreaking when you, um, when you, when you read the stories about these young, very often they're teenagers, very young people who've been killed, some of them participating in the protests, some of them just bystanders. Um, in addition to the indiscriminate use of, of, um, of firearms, um, there have been horrifying stories about um, young people who have been 
who have been beaten to death. Uh, there, were, there were a couple of stories about some young girls who'd been who'd been beaten, you know, severely beaten in the head and face to the point where they, you know, they were practically unrecognizable, you know, and the and the authorities have actually compounded the grief of the families by either refusing to turn over the bodies, um, using the bodies as as blackmail, you know, to coerce them into silence and not speaking about what happened to their loved ones or hastily burying the bodies in secret uh, to uh, to avoid the um, the usual um, Islamic um, death uh, you know and burial rituals that are so important to people, um, thousands of people have been imprisoned. Um, unfortunately, you know CNN. I'm sure most people have seen the horrifying reports of uh, sexual assaults of both uh, young men and women and teenagers, juveniles in custody in Iran. Um, and then, uh, and then, and then, th- you know, hun- hundreds of people have been have been detained. Um, many have been subjected to other kinds of ill treatment, um, and we've documented that at least twenty six people currently are at risk of being um, executed. They are being charged with offenses, very often nebulous um, offenses such as corruption on earth and enmity against God. Um, uh, just for participating in, in in protests, some of them have been accused of of um, injuring or killing government agents, but there's absolutely no evidence that they've been involved in such killings or criminal activity at all. And unfortunately, the government has actually executed um, at least two two individuals, one in a very public hanging um, just a, several days ago. So the government is 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 reacting against these protests with incredibly brutal violence and force. Um, and again, this is just uh, this is just very typical of the Iranian government. Whenever there's any challenge, uh, they immediately crack down. Um, and um, we can we can talk more about about what the what what activists can try to do to uh, to let the Iranian authorities know that we're watching them and we um, we we cannot tolerate this kind of brutality. Thank you, Elise. Um, Shahzad, we would love to hear your perspective. Sure, thank you. Um, I think that's very true that everybody has the same feeling that it is different this time. Um, but at the same time, a lot of people who uh, are like non-Iranians mostly asking us like, um, what happened suddenly? Um, I, I want to go back to to a little bit of time and then think about that. It Although it looks a little bit sudden to a lot of people, but um, it has not been something that suddenly comes out for us. Um, for a lot of people, for for majority of Iranians inside Iran, they have been trying to uh, raise their voice and bring attention to this ongoing brutality of this regime, to this like daily tyranny that is going on for years. Um, I come from a generation that we tried every possible civil tool to to change things like um, the so-called reform movement was was um, rising at a time that my generation was teenagers. We started thinking about that we can make a change. We started making campaigns. We voted. We had like demonstrations in silence. We um, we started like. Uh, literally like the campaign of one million signatures that was one of the earliest campaigns about like in the form of campaign about the women's right it was like literally I would I would hear about it in like underground parties that people would just get together to just have a little bit of time in home aside from the authority so some some woman would come to you and say like do you want to join this campaign so we tried every possible tool to push back the situation, but what we, my generation realized was that the progress under a fascistic ideologic, ideological theocracy is really difficult to happen. It's almost impossible because due to the nature of this structure, you just constantly being pushed back to where you started all the time because the structure doesn't, doesn't correspond with any kind of progress that can happen. As we are talking today, Taliban just announced that all universities are going to be closed on all women, 
um, no matter public or private, there's no way for them to get education. So that is what um, kind of like in Iran also we feel that whatever progress we are trying to make with a single fatwa, with a single like announcement, we can constantly being thrown back to where we started. I guess um, this is something that this generation, the new generation that um, are younger than us and they're the one on the front row on the street, not that they just know, but they also do not validate like the authority that they, um, that they that is trying to control them not just because uh, we didn't also validate, but for them, they grew up in a situation that they do not even see that authority uh, or they don't have like the firsthand um, um, experience that my generation had in the early uh, post 1979 revolution. So uh, I guess I wanna quote one of, the, one of the anonymous users on Twitter and she's a woman in Iran and she was like, during this revolution, I just touched and like felt the way that I can live without this regime, that there's no way for me to go back and continue the way that it, it used to be before. So people have, um, um, by, by going to the streets and by being together and by removing all the signs of this authority, such as hijab and they by holding each other's hand, they have felt that how it could be if they can take down this regime. So for them to undo this feeling, to just go back home and to just like uh, continue, it's something that I feel it's not really possible. It's not a matter of like, this is gonna happen right away or this is gonna happen, you know, uh, tomorrow. This is this is the progress that we needed. And this is the progress that I think we, we need to continue together um, for, for making it happen. Thank you, Sharzad. And I'm going to um, ask one more question from the list of um, general questions that we received in advance, and then we'll open the floor for, for the participants to ask their questions. And for our participants, please feel free to drop your questions in the chat box. I'm going to read it to the panelists um, so you can have an opportunity to engage with them and, and ask um, your, your questions. Um, so Let's make it our, our uh, the the second question from from all the panelists. That um, one of the unique things about this recent uprising is is Iran, in the leader is the leadership and presence and bright presence of women and girls um, in this uprising and this in this movement. Can you share some perspective about that? How how it happens? How um, in a in a country that it's like uh, called Islamic Republic. Uh, or Islamic Republic regime, um, women who probably are among the most oppressed now suddenly are leading the movement, leading the uprising. Um, how about this time starting with Alice? Yeah, um, well, you know, I should say, um, I mean, Iranian women um, have, have actually long been uh, leaders in, in in human rights movements and women's rights movements and children's rights movements. And this is not really something new. I think there's a somewhat of a misconception about um about Iranian women. Uh, first of all, I mean, the majority of 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 university students in Iran are actually women. Uh, Iranian women are extraordinarily highly educated. Um, women in Iran are, you know, are very vibrant and present in the public space. I mean, it, Iranian women have to face a lot of constraints with the system. I mean, Iranian women are discriminated against when it comes to marriage, when it comes to divorce, when it comes to child custody. Uh, Iranian women cannot hold a number of government posts. I mean, the uh, Iranian, uh, an Iranian woman could never, for instance, uh, run for president of, of, of the Islamic Republic. Um, there are a lot of uh, positions, you know, that they, that they cannot hold. But I mean, there are women in parliament, there are women in, so women actually have, you know, have, have had leading roles. I mean, there are women lawyers, there are women physicians, there are women scientists, um, and they've been very outspoken. And we've worked on the cases of a number of very, very prominent women. I mean, of course, every I think a lot of people know about Shirin Ebadi, who's Iran's uh, Nobel Peace Laureate, who's been an extremely outspoken uh, advocate. She's a she's a lawyer. She's represented a lot of very prominent um, dissidents. Unfortunately, she's uh, she's been forced to live in exile. Um, I can cite, you know, Nasrin Sotoudeh, who's an another um, 
human rights attorney who's extraordinarily courageous, um, who served a number of uh, sentences in prison, very long sentences in prison. Um, and you know, there, there are just so many leaders. And even before the current round of protests, um, you know, there were, I mean, there was, uh, you know, as, as I think um, Shahzad, Shahzad mentioned, there was an, a, a one million signature campaign at, uh, more than 10 years now where ordinary people, uh, men and women, would go around uh, collecting signatures, calling for uh, more equity in Iran's family law, for instance, you know, uh, to, uh, to create more e equity in Iran's divorce and child custody laws and so forth, um, and to end the practice of child marriage. Um, and then more recently, there, you know, there have been several uh, activists who have been who were put in prison even before the current uprisings, uh, who have been advocating for um, for an end to mandatory hijab. Um, so, so there is a, a long history of of very activist, uh, very activist women in Iran. Um, uh, the current movement, again, um, as you know, as uh, as Mahia said. Um, uh, one one thing about Mahsa Amini is that she was not an activist. You know, she was not someone who was trying to make a, a statement. I mean, there had been many women previously who'd who'd taken pictures, who'd you know very publicly removed their hijab, had you know had videos of themselves made removing their hijab. Ma Mahsa was not doing that. Mahsa was just um, you know she was actually uh, on a trip to, to to Tehran with her family. And uh, and and the morality police just uh, you know just thought she was not wearing her hijab pro appropriately, even though she actually was wearing hijab. Uh, so people really felt like uh, that this could happen to anyone. This could happen to their mother. This could happen to their sister. This could happen to their daughter. And of course, I think probably most Iranians either have ha experienced it themselves or know somebody who's experienced this kind of harassment. So it really you know touched a chord. Um, but you know, it's it's just been extraordinary. I mean, there have been several reports of of teenage girls, you know, in schools who have, um, you know, who have made very uh, public, um, pro who have you know been publicly protesting. Sometimes they've even been visited by government officials and they've heckled them, which is an extraordinarily extraordinarily brave thing to do. And I just again, you know, just want to underscore what I said before about the incredibly brutal. Um, crackdown that that people have experienced just for just for expressing their opinion uh exercising their their universally recognized right to to express their opinion um so uh you know mo i don't i mean i i don't think i could face you know um that kind of brutality um knowing that you know i i might not come home that night just by by participating in a protest so um, I think we're all in awe of these people and uh, teenagers, young university students. It's really extraordinary. Thank you, Elise. Um, Shahzad, Mahia, um, anything to add about the leadership of women um, and girls in, in this um, movement? Mm, yeah, I mean, uh, I think you mentioned very cor correctly, I mean, women who have been under operation for more than 40 years now but i think that's exactly the reason that we, women are on in the front lines uh, because i mean similar to taliban in afghanistan uh, that shahzad mentioned this islamic ideology that the islamic republic of iran taliban represents in their essence they're against women uh, that's why basically the main slogan of this movement is woman life freedom so the first word is actually women because that's if you that's the root of this movement and that's what exactly the Islamic Republic is against um and I think um I mean Ellis mentioned it very well that women's women move Iranian women movement is not of course something new it has a history we need to recognize that for example one million signature campaign I was involved in that campaign uh, and of course, I mean, th there's this history that we need to understand that women have been always active um, in such campaigns in like civil disobedience uh, inside Iran. Uh, but I think the important thing to understand about this movement is that, uh, and why it's basically to some extent grassroots, what we call grassroots movement, is that these are really ordinary women. They haven't been as, at least that they haven't been activists, Maso wasn't an activist. Women that are on the street, like schoolgirls that you see 
they are shouting, they're ch chanting the most radical slogans and they're taking off their scarves in the school, they are really ordinary people without much experience of activism. Their daily life is activism. Their daily life is civil disobedience. And that's the important thing. I mean, because as I said, my research has been on campaigns like My Sense of Freedom, like uh, White Wednesday. One of the important thing about those campaigns was that it has involved um, really ordinary, I mean, ordinary is not a good word because I mean, everybody is ordinary. I mean, some, no one is non-ordinary. But by, what I mean is that uh, women started from different classes, from different cities, they have started practicing uh, activism and civil disobedience in simple forms uh, against hijab. And of course it has led to really a big movement and it has, it has made hijab um, a political issue uh, rather than personal. If it has been always political, I mean, I'm not saying that it has been personal at some points, but it has made it something that we, we we thought, okay, we need to fight for. We have this is an this is an experience that all women from all classes, from all ages, uh, they have experienced it. So they it made some something political. Uh, so I think the the important thing about this movement is that it it consists of really ordinary people. It starts with uh, something as basic as compulsory hijab uh, that everybody has experienced with. And that this movement is really a feminist movement. It's a feminist revolution because the values that um, people are fighting for, they are really progressive. The slogan, woman, life, freedom, is one of the most progressive slogans that I've ever seen. Um, so it is not that shocking that women are on the, in the front lines and they are kind of leading this movement uh, because they, they have been always under oppression and they know that they don't they don't want it anymore so for them it is the matter of life and death like massa um so yeah that's that's basically my thought on that thank you and before going through the questions that we have in the chat Shahzad, we would love to um hear your perspective on that sure um do you mind if I share my screen and show a couple of slides related to the question? To your slide. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Uh, so to answer the question, um, I actually want to talk a little bit about like how um, um, it like go back to the fact that how it all started, or give a little bit of like context about that why women and especially like teenagers. Uh, girls are in the front row of this movement. Um, I think we need to notice that what actually happened when the revolution of 1979, the Islamic revolution happened and then when Khomeini basically took power, um, I guess um, the, the reframing hijab as the anti-imperialist flag and as like the um, like ideological symbol of a Muslim woman was something that actually was pretty much in action. Uh, if the notions was like, goes back to pre 1979 um, revolution, but the formation of the whole idea was actually in action for Iran to be the first country to have mandatory hijab for women, that's how it is started. So um, I guess this, this whole image of like a woman in black chador head to toe um, representing the Muslim women. And in the, in the beginning of the revolution, it was like even with an arm like, uh, or a gun or like holding the picture of Khomeini, that's the image that was vastly reported to the media and to the visual attention of the world that this is what a Muslim woman is. Um, so Khomeini, um, I think uh, was clearly uh, make it happen. Uh, before the evolution of 1979, the, the, the Iran um, society was experiencing women to uh, not uh, belonging to the traditional role of um, like mother or householder, or, you know, like somebody who is like, um, so the, the gender role of women, the role of them, um, in the society was changing. The society was experiencing women to 
um, like uh, having their right to vote, going to universities, like um, having driving, like owning properties. So there were like a, a strong presence of women in the society, which was establishing in the pre-79, the modernization era, uh, generally in the Middle East. And what after the revolution of 79 happened is that Khomeini realized that these women are already out. They are present in the society. So um, not like the way that we are seeing now in Taliban, that they're like completely removing them from the face of the society by pushing them back in homes and putting them in a burqa. Khomeini decided to um, basically repurpose that that presence in and like basically obtain it visually for its own purpose. So what he did was that you may you are still allowed to come out of home, but you have to look the way that I like because you need to look like my soldiers. You need to look like the soldiers of our ideology. And the hijab basically transformed from a traditional or like uh, uh, um, you know and uh, a uh, Sharia order or law into something that was highly political because at this point all these women looked like the soldiers or the loyals to the Islamic Republic without them wanting or not. Um, so I grew up, my generation grew up with a lot of posters like this, which was basically announcing the Islam, the Muslim women to be like. So this woman, this figure in the middle of the poster is holding this word that says hijab. And then it's holding also a, a book that is, uh, I think, just raising a very tiny piece of Quran, um, which says this fight against the uh, uh, enemies and against the kafirs. And um, so framing hijab as your arm, uh, your like a weapon to to fight with imperialism was something that was highly projected on my generation. And um, um, it continued uh, to be um, framing as like a flag of imperialism. Um, what happened along all these years is that the, the ones that tried to push back this idea, the ones that re um, owned the idea of hijab, the ones that tried to change it were the women. It was the women who decided to stop wearing the chador, change it into like some colorful outfits. They were the ones that who decided to drop it. They were the, the ones that decided to um, like uh, re-own their bodies. But unfortunately what was happening a lot, especially in the West, was that the narrative was kind of sometimes you could see that the narrative is uh, kind of promoting the government to be uh, credited for all these changes. We would hear it from a lot of the decision makers about the con um, people who are consulting the, the Western uh, politicians that, oh, the government is becoming more tolerant about this. The government is allowing the changes to happen. The government is uh, not really putting this roles in practice. The credit should never have gone to the government. The credit was always for women. It was the women who were changing all these and they were trying to reown this, um, their bodies and likely push back the hijab as much as possible. And um, so like you can see that this, this is an, the, one, one of the very first a protest after the revolution of 1979 that that is like a anti-hijab protest in 1981 um two years after the revolution and this is the image of the funeral at massa gina amini uh when when she was killed by the islamic republic even the image shows us that this has been going on for women uh for for 40 years and um so i want to now go to talking about that, how this new generation that like Armita Abbasi is one of them, Nika Shakarami is one of them. A lot of the teenagers that we see that they are uh, in the front row, they're being arrested, they're being raped, they're being killed and their bodies are being like um, horribly given back to this whole um, society that is the, the the whole people that are standing against the Islamic Republic as like 
a form of uh, very painful punishment saying that this is what's going to happen if you're going to stand against us. Is This is what's going to happen if you, uh, if you try to take back your body. We give you back your body, but in, in this way. And I guess that's, um, that is making it very, very um, tragic for, for people who are on the street. But at the same time, this generation, um, I sometimes say fortunately, they don't carry a lot of the baggage and a lot of the traumas that my generation had, um, especially even in the intellectual forms. Like they are not carrying the baggage of the reformist versus radical rhetoric. They're not carrying the baggage of the communist versus imperialist um, rhetorics. All these rhetorics that um, made uh, the moving for my generation really difficult, really painful. I was talking to one of them the other night and he was like, I grew up with Netflix. I, my generation grew up watching the same material that is produced in the West. And a lot of the people my generation is um, watching it around the world. They are the generation that are K-pop fans. They are the ones that are watching the BTS, I don't know, performances. So for them, the question here is not that, um, like the questions they have is very different from the questions we had. For them, the question is, why aren't we just part of the world? Why aren't we present? What, where is our representation in all these productions that is happening? I wanna be there. I wanna be one of the people who is represented in all these productions. And for them to answer this question in avoidingly is like, this regime must be removed. But I sometimes feel like this is actually very hopeful because my generation was quite tight with like all these dynamics and the roles of like, um, the power uh, structure that was there for them it's it's a little bit more obvious but it's a little, but I, I think they have a will and they will find a way um this is this is probably what's going to happen like I mean a lot of people talk about that um look at them they look like you know like a westerner teenager they look like a teenager that is going to school probably in Germany in in the US, um, um, but uh, this is also one thing that I wanna talk about that um, we need to acknowledge the fact that um, these are, we, when, we, when we say they look like any teenagers, we actually say that they look like teenagers in the West. Um, and I think we need to acknowledge the fact that this is what happened gradually after the revolution of 1979, the revolution that is started with the slogan, no to the East, no to the West, but the Islamic Republic eventually started to ally with the East Bloc. It did start to ally with China, with Russia, uh, with Venezuela, with all those countries. And it started to remove any kind of appearance that was um, resembling some sort of like uh, Western ideas of life they started to push it back and they started to remove it. And I think that is what has happened. And I briefly, I'm gonna go over these slides um, of that, how like the, the women movement in Iran goes back to 170 years and it's not like something that has started and even, even more than that, but this is because this is like uh, just a um, you know, short uh, form of slides that I have created. I think um, I'm just going quickly over some of them which um, I think like the movement standing against the institutionalized Islamism that was trying to push back the, um, the, the women started way uh, years ago, like many years ago when the scholars such as um, Tahir Abu Rasul Ain, who was a Baha'i scholar, um, started to um, um, uh, stand against the, the other scholars, Islamist uh, Baha'i scholars and, uh, and claiming uh, its own agency and its own voice by removing her burqa. At the time, removing the burqa was something like as if she removed the hijab entirely and she got executed for this. And um, like Sadiq Dolat uh, Abadi was like another uh, figure that was uh, highly active for the human rights and especially about his uh, hijab. And um, like um, Homa Darabi who set herself in, on fire uh, in uh, after the revolution in opposed to hijab, 
uh, uh, a lot of campaigns that started by Massey, uh, Alinejad, uh, which uh, transform this kind of activism and this awareness about the hijab from uh, the upper class, the scholar classes, like uh, the people who had the, the class that had uh, access to education to the women who were not necessarily having the same uh, privilege or access. Uh, there were That's women. Right, Shasha, do you mind if we um, share these materials with the participants via link? Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I will. So many questions and only few yeah. minutes left. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Them. Yeah, yeah, totally. I will. I will share all these um, slides to to you in the audience. Just wanted to say that this is this is something that um, like uh, has been going on uh, in, back in a little bit of time, and this is where we are now. And that's wonderful. I think um, the, the the history is very important to understand that this is not something new, but we are all hoping that this would be something different. Uh, while I'm asking the questions from participants and uh, waiting for, for you to reply, I'm also going to drop some petitions that participants can sign or some actions that they can take. Um, so I think the first question, um, Sharza John, you already answered that what is the relationship between Gen Z, you talked about it. So I'm going to just move to, to the second question that asks about um, the still ongoing or willingness of um, negotiating with Iran, specifically on nuclear deal. And one of our participants are uh, is asking, what is the consequences of con this continuation of negotiation with Iran or specifically a nuclear deal and uh, violations of women's rights in Iran. And I welcome any any reply from any of the parties, any of the panelists. <laughs> That's um, so I think Sharzad is like um, talking in our native language. <laughs> Uh, I'm so sorry. I'm just, I'm that's fine. That, that's perfectly fine. Um, and I can, yeah. I mean, if at least, or I mean, I can't start. Um, I think I'm, I'm totally against. I and I think uh, that's true for many Iranians. I'm totally against the nego. I'm continuing the negotiation, uh, the nuclear deal uh, with the Iranian government, of course, because. I think what Iranian people uh, made clear during these three months is that uh, they don't recognize the Islamic Republic as their legitimate government. So neither should the board, neither should the West, neither should the US and the European Union, of course. Um, so I think, I mean, when we talk about intervention, that we don't want intervention from the West, I mean, they are the, against uh, intervention. They should understand that right now, continuing to negotiate with the government that is murdering people inside the country, that is violating the human rights that, as uh, Elise said very well, um, they accepted themselves um, by being uh, part of the United Nations. Um, so by, by doing that, they are kind of intervening in the internal matters of our country because People don't recognize this government. They don't want this government. This government for them is not legitimate. So they should, I, I think they should make it clear. They should say clearly that they would stop negotiating with the Iranian government in terms of nuclear deal or any other thing. Thank you. Um, any other comments about negotiations with Iran? Yeah, I also think um, it is very important to be clear about this, that um, a lot of people, like I, I, I see that this question bring, bring come up, coming up that, but if we don't negotiate, how do we stop them from the nuclear? Like, what if we don't? So this is something that I guess, like we women are trying to say that um, the, the regime made a promise also for us that the hijab is not gonna be mandatory. The, the um, the rights is going to be reserved, like uh, all these um, things that um, they they promise the women that this is not going to be the way it is now. But they did not keep their promises. Like this is not a regime that through the negotiation they're going to commit to any kind of deals or commit to any kind of 
um, promises they're making at this point. Um, I guess if you understand the ideology, they are looking for the time that they have more power so that they can come back and stand against you. This is how the structure of this regime has formed that like whoever, they are completely anti-Westerners, they're completely anti, um, thinking about that, like whoever is not part of these Islamic society that they have or Islamic empire that they're creating in their mind is the, should, should be pushed back and should be possessed by the power. And I think um, the negotiating with this regime is not necessarily guaranteeing any kind of promises that they might uh, have this uh, clear in the negotiations because a regime that is based on the hierarchy of an Islamic understanding of um, the, uh, the structure and the institution of Islamism is gonna like even change negotiation and lift it with a single fatwa. And Ayatollah can appear on the TV and say, you know what, I changed my mind. This is the fatwa that I changed my mind about a bomb. I changed my mind about the nu nuclear deal. And this structure can be over or like overnight can, can, can change. So um, I think it should be clear that negotiations is not necessarily gonna work in the way that a lot of people expect it to work. And it's gonna actually help to empower this government and to, to um, basically uh, oppress the people even more with, with all the deals that they get through the negotiations. Thank you. And um, maybe t we had time for one more question. And I think the last question is kind of um, a question of many, uh, many people these days. What will happen next and how we can help um, people in Iran to join the movement um, or have the encouragement um, to risk their lives to, to fight? Um, well, I can jump in and, and I think maybe to be, begin to address another one of the questions I saw in the chat, and that's the role of the um, international community. So um, Amnesty International um, had been really advocating for uh, the UN Human Rights Council in Geneva to establish an independent investigative and accountability mechanism for Iran. Um, so we 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 would, had really been pushing for it. We actually um, joined with 42 other organizations, NGOs, uh, and issued a um, an open letter calling for the establishment of this entity. Um, and Amnesty actually um, accumulated. We we gathered uh, more than 800,000 signatures on a, a worldwide petition, um, including a lot of people from Iran who signed it. A lot of people from the United States who signed it. And we actually had a victory in um, on November 24th in Geneva when the uh, UN Human Rights Council actually did vote to establish this investigative body, um, which is going to focus on the human rights violations, um, especially uh, those uh, that have happened in the last three months um, in the wake of the um, in, in, after the, the death and custody of Maxa Amini and the, and the protests. So that's a real victory. And I think it shows that um, you know a concerted effort can make a big difference. Um, you know, this is obviously something that the Iranian government did not want to happen. You know, they do not want to be the um, you know the focal point of the international uh, community. Um, and um, uh, you know, some, some people think, oh, you know, the Iranian government doesn't care what the world thinks. But I would say, no, absolutely not. The Iranian government actually very, very much cares about what the world thinks. Um, and the more countries that vote, and we, we were actually pleasantly surprised that um, that more countries actually voted for the establishment of the uh, of this body than we had uh, than we had actually anticipated. So, um, it, so I think it really is important for the international community to show um, that um, it very strongly condemns the uh, human rights violations by Iran. Um, so. You know, and, and it, it can't only be countries uh, in, in the so-called West. Um, it's really, really important that uh, countries all over the world um, condemn uh, Iran's human rights violations. Um, and uh, one of the 
questions in the chat was about the participation of people from certain countries on, on this UN commission. And I would say, well, first of all, um, you know, every country is varied. I mean, in any country, including the United States, you have a broad, you know, you have a full spectrum of, of, of political opinion. Some people are obviously very far to the right. Some people are very progressive. So it's really hard to say what, what person represents, you know, the, you know, the consensus in any particular country. I would say there, there is no such thing. Um, but um, I think it is really important to have uh, representation from, um, from, from countries all over the world, including uh, countries that have a majority Muslim population. I will point out that, you know, uh, in, 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 the, in the modern, in the, you know, in the last uh, 10 years, 11 years, um, the, uh, the Iran, the special rapporteur, um, uh, the UN special rapporteur on the situation of human rights in Iran has have, have actually all been uh, people, jurists, very, very respected scholars and jurists from uh, Muslim countries. Um, the first one um, uh, was from the Mald Maldives and, and the current uh, rapporteur and the, and the immediate predecessor were both uh, of Pakistan, were both from Pakistan actually. So, um, and they've been extraordinary people advocating for human rights in Iran. The current um, uh, rapporteur Javed Rahman has not pulled any of his punches because he happens to be a Muslim man uh, of Pakistan origin. So I, I would say it's, it's, it, we should certainly not um, exclude people uh, from, from Muslim majority countries from participating on these, on these important commissions. Thank you, Alice. And, and our time is up. I know there are a couple of questions that we didn't get into, um, but we would love to be in touch with, with, with the participants. Reach out to Brown Open Classroom team. I know that the uh, uh, video will be edited, posted online in, in, the, in the channel uh, of uh, Brown Open Classroom. And you, you know the name of the panelists. Um, you, you, can, you can reach out to them and, and continue having the discussion. Um, now the thank yous are in the chat uh, for the panelists. Um, thank all the three amazing panelists uh, who made time to be with us today and thank uh, many thanks to Brown School for hosting us. Thank you, everyone.